Welcome to the Super Sentai Brothers. This is episode 22 of License to Car Ranger, the internet's best and only podcast dedicated to Gekiso Sentai Car Ranger. Every week we watch an episode of the show and we share our thoughts with you, the listener. My name is Matt J. With me as always is my co-host and brother Dave. Dave, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm fine, man. Had a lovely day. Nice, nice. First, uh, I, you know, we're in our first full one or two days of summer here. Uh, and I, of course... As the oh, that's right. King. It is officially summer, isn't yeah. it? As, as the new king of summer, uh, I, I, I welcome you to it, Dave. I am always I, like the only way I have now realized that, like, I can kind of remember when when the seasons is that it's just on like the it's on like the solstice and yeah, and yeah equinox, yeah. Which, but like, that's the only no other way makes sense to me. Like, paying attention to the weather. I'm like, man, it should have been summer like a while ago, except we've been having like a cold, wet summer. Um, but is today, is today, was today the solstice? Uh, last night was the, the, the I think the longest, uh, or the okay. latest Like I knew it was coming year. up. It would, knew, I knew it was like very close because I've been looking outside and I'm like, man, it's like 923 and it's still light out. Like we must be right in the zone. It is. Yeah, it is delightful. Uh, anyway, um... So yeah, it's it has been a lovely day, Dave. And you know what will make it even lovelier? Is talking about episode two of Gekiso Sentai Car Ranger. It is called The Tragic Traffic Rule Habit. A title that I don't plan on saying more than once or twice again, because it's sort of a tongue twister. Um, but Dave, of course, before we get into that, as always, shining in the heavens, there are five stars. Would you like to hear what our first star of the week is? Uh, yeah, please. Dave, uh, once again... I have I have donned the corporate challenge like office branded t-shirt and gone out into the world of the corporate challenge and tried to do my very best to represent our office in shuffleboard. Now I don't get okay, sorry, real quickly, is corporate is this like a like a warrior run sort of like is somebody running this thing? Is this like an is there like a corporation that's like, oh yeah, we're the corporate challenge people, and our jam is that we like set this up for everyone and like keep score? Okay, the answer is yes, but I don't know if it's like a company or just like an or like a volunteer organization. I I frankly that seems insane that it would be volunteers. Like this is a huge because like I had never heard of this. Before, like, Beth's, like, Beth's brothers are, like, business guys, and they're, yeah. like, real into corporate challenge. I was like, oh, okay, this must just be, like, an Austin thing where they live. And then I started hearing about it more. Obviously, like, I'm not in business, so, like, this is not something I'm connected to. And it, ju- I was like, it's just such a weird thing to me. Like, all right, man, here's what we're going to do on our Saturday, like, our day off where we don't have to go to work. We're going to get together with work people. And then we're going to go to another thing where there's going to be other people that are also working on their day off, and we're going to play shuffleboard for no extra pay. I, I think... I Okay, I've done this now two years in a row. You'd think that I would know more about what this actual process is. I have no idea. Basically, here's my involvement with it, is that someone said, Hey, Matt, you guys did shuffleboard last year, and it went pretty well. We need someone for the shuffleboard team. And I thought... Yeah, sure. Like, it's... Like, yes, it is work... Like, a work-related thing, non during work hours. But it's with people that I like, and it's, like, at a bar, and the shuffleboard is free. Because it's being oh, okay. paid for by the stuff. No, no, okay. That's fine, then. That makes much more sense to me. Because I was about to say, like, I attend roughly two, like, work-related non-work events a year. And the only reason I, it's like the union hosts like a social hour at a bar. And the only reason I go is because it's A, at a bar, and B, there's free food. Yeah, see, that is the thing, is there are a bunch of other um, corporate challenge events like, hey, do you want to go play basketball? It's like, no, I don't want to go play basketball. Here's what I want to do. There's the one that I do, and then the other one that I would like to do someday. I do shuffleboard. The other one is ski ball. Like, and both of those are at a bar. Now, the weird thing. Okay, no, see, yeah, see, that makes a ton of sense. Yeah, the, the ski ball happens on like a weekday evening, right? Shuffleboard happens Saturday mornings. That is two a weird years time in a to row. A, 
play shuffleboard. No, actually, let me rephrase that. That's a perfect time to play real shuffleboard. It's a weird time to play bar shuffleboard. It's a weird time to play bar shuffleboard. I think the only time that would be better to play real shuffleboard than a Saturday morning would be like a Tuesday morning. Because that's when you would be able to play it if you were like retired and or on a cruise. Right, right. And that, like that seems like shuffleboard's like prime demographic. Like I, retired I think, and or yeah. on a cruise. I shuffleboard. Think, I think genuinely the reason we do it in the mornings is because the like the shuffleboard bar that we go to to do it is booked up in the evenings. Hold up, this is a shuffleboard. Sorry. Also, if you were like a 19th century British aristocrat, probably also find a play. Sure shuffleboard the shuffleboard bar so this is not a okay so sorry you're not playing like bar shuffleboard this is not like a bar version of this game you're playing full-on shuffleboard at a bar that exists to be like dedicated to shuffleboard is that what you're telling me yeah did i not properly explain this last year it is a bar with uh five full-size shuffleboard courts and like two slightly smaller ones out on the patio. That's... It's called Forest City Shuffleboard. It's on Lorraine in Ohio City. Um, it's fun. Is this a thing... Okay, so I have heard of bars like this before. This was a, there, was like, there was a thing in the news a while ago, and it's called uh, it was called Pong, and it was up in New York, and it was like a ping pong bar. It was like very, very big. It was like super hot for a while, I think. Is this what people, like, if you're just a bad conversationalist, are you like, well, I like the idea of a bar, but then I go and I don't know what to do, because the only things you do at a bar and drink are talk, and I can't drink too much, and I'm bad at talking, so shuffleboard? Is that, like, is that the... Okay, uh, I think that's probably part of it. It's probably a great spot for, like, a, not a first date, but, like, a second date. No, that makes a ton of, like, no, sorry, that sounded like I was digging on people. I'm, I'm totally not. I'm just trying to, like, understand. Because in my universe, like, I love to talk, as evidenced by the past five years of podcasts. Right, right. I, like, right. And, like, if I'm going to go to a bar, like, not every single time, but, like, you're probably there if I'm at a bar. I know that's not necessarily the case in reverse, but, like, if I'm at a bar, you're probably there. And so, like, really all I need, like, I just need beer and I need somebody to talk to. And, like, I'm set. I can see if that was, if you would not be set. Like, that's a non-set scenario for you. You'd be like, oh, thank goodness, shuffleboard. Like, literally anything. I I do think they probably, I think they probably get some people like that. I I also think that, like, it is not so much an alternative to a non-shuffleboard bar as it is an alternative to, like, a bowling a alley, shuffleboard, right, right, right. Like a bowling alley. Yeah, you know, a bowling alley is a place with like beer and also an activity. Uh, okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Also, I w- I have to admit, I've never played shuffleboard. Uh, it's surprisingly fun. It's kind of like um, I imagine it to be sort of botchy esque, but with like a point zone. Imagine something in between botching and curling, or botching and curling. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a game wherein like you have to get another thing into a specific spot a ways away. Correct. That's basically all ga- all all games as I think about it. Like all semi-athletic games is like get a ball into a place a far way away right. in some form or another. You slide the puck called a biscuit across Love the it. thing and you try to get it into the point zone and you try to not get it into the negative point zone and into then, the negative zone. I really yeah. feel like you dropped the ball. Could we go back? Can we do this one in post, Mark, so Matt can pick up the negative zone joke there, please? Okay, yeah, yeah okay. Let's let's uh, hear it. Sinking in. Sinking in. Three, three two. two. I did think this was going to be a bit where we weren't going to do it in post, and we were just going to leave all of this in. Oh, I did too. I thought would... we were. I thought we were leaving the sink in as well. well okay. Well, I guess now we don't have to. Gonna... We don't have to leave the sink in. Let's cut back to while we were talking about doing it in post, but before we started the sink. Yeah, not because now the bit's really. If we left all this in, this is too much. I feel bit. like this is too much bit. Now we're getting into like Steve Martin levels of like, is it still a bit? It might still be a bit. See, now the problem is if the bit keeps going, it might circle know. back around to being funny. But I'm not confident I'm about not it. Completely sure when. Yeah, when we would hit the full the full bit. Mark, we'll leave it up to you. If this has become a bit again. 
then uh, then you go ahead. Well, yeah, but in, in anyway, if it doesn't feel like this is a bit, feel free to cut out all the non-bit stuff. But now, Dave, let me take that again. So, Dave, you gotta get the you you get the puck, which is called a biscuit, and you mm-hmm. slide it down the thing, and you try to get into the the point zone. Uh, where you, you know you can get positive points. You try to right. avoid the negative zone because that's where Annihilus consumes all of your points. <laughs> right. He's yeah. Him and or Blastar is the living really bombers. Yeah, the living bombers. Okay, He's just such double a check him. Weird. <laughs> such a bizarre character. Anyway, shuffleboard is great. We got absolutely creamed. Like oh yeah. We no no no. See, and I can tell you why because the other team like they are regulars at this bar. Like they know the bartender. No, Dave, I know the bartender. I was there two days prior. We practiced for an hour. Like, I know yeah, two of the bartenders who late. work there. <laughs> too little too late. I've told you my only good story. This is like a secondhand story about Corporate Challenge, right? You might have already said it on the podcast, frankly. Okay, uh, then yeah. So that's, see, you're you're too little too late if you're practicing like two days before for for an hour. These people are like rockying this. Last year, we got second place in our division. This year, we were out of the tournament so quickly that the bar hadn't had time to open their kitchen yet, and we had to go somewhere else to get food. Oh, jeez. It was really embarrassing, <laughs> but very fun. <laughs> it's like, I love you, but that's pretty bad. Yeah, it was rotten. Speaking of breakfasts, Dave, what is our second star of the week? So our second star of the week is I had a sort of like a breakfast revelation. So we went to the farmer's market this morning and there was a woman there and she, it was kind of, it's like weird because she's opening up an Ethiopian restaurant like in Lakewood, which is on like the other side of town from us, which is weird for her to be there, but whatever. And uh, she was doing kind of like a, like a soft open. Like, I like guess. a pop-up sort of thing. Like a pop-up soft open f- for her restaurant. But she wasn't making, like, breakfast food. She was just making, like, Ethiopian food. But it was, like, 9.30 in the morning, and I hadn't had much breakfast. So I was like, well, I love Ethiopian food. Like, let's, we'll snap, we'll get some. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm eating. So, like, we get some, and it's, like, this, like, fiery, like, chicken stew thing with, like, a whole hard-boiled egg in it. And then, like, some uh, stewed cabbage with, like, turmeric, and then, like, some spicy lentils. And then you eat. You eat Ethiopian food with this like a uh, flat sourdough bread pancake sort of thing called injera, mm-hmm. and it's delicious. And I was like eating it for, and I'm eating it for breakfast basically. And I'm like, this is a like, and I like it anyways. But I was like, this is a fantastic breakfast. Like this is amazing. Like it's it's savory. It's like it's really filling. It's very healthy. Like I don't feel gross afterwards. Like it's like. Really pleasant. I like spicy food. I'm like, this is really pleasantly spicy. I'm woken up. There's even an egg in it. Like, I was gonna I'm say that egg to- really, I feel like, puts it over the top. Yeah, I was like, I am good to go. This is breakfast food now, and I was just sort of thinking about breakfast and how lame American breakfast is. Like, as a rule, I will make an exception for like, like if you really like do up an American breakfast, right? Like. Bacon, sausage. I was you know, gonna like, say, to- like, et cetera, et cetera. there is a version of like a full American breakfast that is not the same as like a full English breakfast, but, right? But they're know, very similar. I mean, listen, I'm not gonna suggest that you go and have like the farmer boy breakfast that takes like three pages to describe and includes an entire apple pie, but like, <laughs> there is a very good version of the American breakfast, right? Like, the full American is good, but like, it's like it's a bowl of cereal for breakfast in the morning. That's a terrible breakfast. Go, like, eat eat something better. And then I was thinking about pancakes. And now listen, producer Mark is the king of... I don't know if he's the king of pancakes, because that would imply that he, like, makes the best pancakes ever. And he might. I just don't know, because I've never eaten them. He makes a very fine pancake. I can vouch for I this. But I would say producer Mark is the king of loving pancakes. That is undisputably true. That's, yeah, that I don't... I've never met a human being that loves pancakes as much as producer Mark... But and I also love pancakes. Don't get me wrong. But if you ask me to design like the worst, the worst food to actually eat for a real human being's breakfast, pancakes would be like pretty close. It'd be like just eat like a giant sugar bomb that's carbohydrates underneath that. Like that. That's for you. That's breakfast for you. And then just like feel sluggish for the rest of the day. 
Like pan- like pancakes are great, but they're not breakfast. Unless you've been like shivering through a Canadian winter and you're about to go like chop down trees with an axe, in which case like get crazy, my friend. I but, f- uh, but- I, yeah, I, I feel as though the, the trick, Dave, is that a lot of the sorts of breakfast foods that you're talking about is like what might be a more ideal breakfast have at some point and for some reason been transitioned into brunch foods instead. And and yeah. therefore are like only available at eleven thirty a.m. on a weekend. Right. It's like no, 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 dude. And like you could only get them at a restaurant where the chef is miserable. Right. No, you don't that. Anyways, Matt. So uh, I'm going to be trying to incorporate a lot more like Ethiopian food in my breakfasts. That's really what I what I wanted to say, and I suggest you do the same. That's a generalized you, not not you specifically, Matt. Although you would be included. In that you, what, Matt, is our third star of the week? Dave, third star of the week is a new video game I have on my phone. Okay. It is called, well, it's not called Harry Potter Go, but that's what it is. It's called Wizards oh, Unite. yes, yes, yes. Yeah, um, everybody on our, our friend's email chain has been shooting out, like, friend codes for uh, this thing. Yeah, Harry, it, it, they called it Wizards Unite, which is, like, maybe the only dorkier thing they could have called it than just Harry Potter Go. Yeah, they should have just stuck with because it's the same people, right? Like, yeah, it's, 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 it's Neantic the, or whatever it's called. Yes, it is. Um, here is the thing, though. You know how Pokemon Go, like, it is better now than it was at launch, but it's still kind of barely a game. I I, do, I know because you have mentioned it. I've never I never played Pokemon Go. Okay, well, uh, it is better now than when it launched, but it is still sort of barely a game. It is like a that's kind of the impression that I got, which is why I never played it. It's like an AR experience. That is fun if you like Pokemon, and it gives you a bit of incentive to, like, go out for an extra walk sometimes. Like, that's kind of okay. Um, there's, there's, I, I, I understand that Listen, people... Listen, anything that encourages people to walk can't be, like, half bad, but... But here's the thing about Wizards Unite, is that, like, they made Pokemon Go, it made them a bunch of money, and they spent all of that money figuring out how to make a better version of Pokemon Go, and that is what Wizards Unite is. Like... It's it, it's actually a video game, which is really weird. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that sounds fun. I'm like, not going to play it. Like, Dave, I have a class. I have a class with a... I unlocked a skill tree, and I'm purchasing skills to, like, increase my stats. So that Wait, when what I, class? What class? Is, is this, like, a potions class or, like, history of magic class? Oh, no, like, no, no. I have, like, uh, like, a job class. Oh, that's very confusing nomenclature, given the subject of this game. Well, the thing is that you don't play students. And you, you don't play Hogwarts students. You play adult wizards who are doing stuff. Oh, God, thank goodness. That's immediately... I'm still... Again, I'm still not going to play this game. That's immediately so much better. Oh, yeah, no. If this was a game where, like, you wandered around Hogwarts and did stuff, I would be much less interested. But the thing is, since it's an AR game that's overlaid on top of, like, the map of where you currently are, like, it can't be in Hogwarts because Hogwarts isn't in Cleveland. <laughs> right. And so, instead, you are, like, adult wizards who are doing a thing and trying to, like, recover, like, lost whatevers. Got it. Do you have to play one of the American Wizarding Academy houses, or are you playing the British houses? You're playing the British houses. Um, I kind of wish there was an option for the American ones, but... uh, I was going to say, like, you're in America, if it's, like, an AR overlay of where you are. So, anyway, like, instead of, like... Finding a Pokemon, clicking on that Pokemon, like, swiping your finger to throw a Pokeball at it and hoping that it works. You go into a thing, and you have to, like, cast a specific spell by tracing your finger, like, across, like, a a sigil that's on the screen in order to, like, grab a thing. Oh, man. And then... That does seem very cool. And then sometimes, instead of just trying to, like, affect something with one spell, you get into a fight, and there's, like, a back and forth between you and the thing... Oh, where, dang. where you're like focusing your cursor on them until you like get up like enough charge to throw off an attack spell, but then if they attack you, you have to like counter it with a protection spell. Okay, here is okay. And, like I, I, think... I don't want to get like fully into the minutia of it, but what I'm trying to communicate to you is that like I like when I hit level six, they're like, hey, do you want to be an auror, a magizoologist, or a professor? And then like here's the skill tree associated with that choice. And it will help you when you go into the fortresses and have to fight werewolves. I'm like, oh, this is a video game. 
<laughs> I think there's a real... Okay, so I like the idea of a tracing mechanic that is pretty fun. I think this is a real lost opportunity to not have this game work on uh, like voice recognition because nothing would make me happier than a bunch of nerds wandering around <laughs> Cleveland just yelling like... Expecto Patronum, just screaming Expecto Patronum into their phone, but like they can't say it right. And then you have, like they should have gotten a hold of um, the Emma, Emma Watson and just paid her however many dollars it took for her to say it all properly. And then when you say it wrong, she just she says just it yells properly at you. in like a really condescending voice. And your phone plays that back to you until you say it right. And then you can do your fake magic spell. <laughs> But it like if you don't trace your finger along the thing properly, it's like eh, you kind of did it, but you didn't really do it. So this isn't going to be super effective. Well, I mean that is uh, that is true to the books. There's like one I remember. There's one spot where it's like a flick and swish, and if you don't sort of like do it just right, like it, again, like the spell doesn't work properly. So really, you should have to do both. Really, they should no, no. They should have used the motion sensor in your phone and made you like whip your phone around in a weird way and use the voice recognition technology at the same time. So you've got to like swing your phone around like a goober and yell expecto patrono. That's can you the imagine, only way a fake werewolf doesn't kill you. Can you imagine how many people would throw their phones? <laughs> well, then they could sell you a strap oh, and they could tell yes. you that it's made out of like, you know, unicorn fur or something. Right. Olivander's phone strap. <laughs> yes, this is a. <laughs> this listen, is the phone are, strap already, that has chosen you. Right, people already bought like the Pokemon Go dongle. This is a missed opportunity. I should be. I have amazing opinions, Matt. I should be on the board for this company. I mean, this they, game would have been a million times better. I w- like. Listen, the game is two days old. I would be pretty surprised if at some point they did not sell like a wand peripheral. That you, like, Bluetooth synced to your phone and did stuff oh, that yeah, way. Oh, yeah, no, they have to. They have to. They have to. Anyway. It would be embarrassing yeah. if they didn't, frankly. Uh, anyway. The, for them. It's not for the person who bought a <laughs> wand. Uh, it's a real game, and it's actually fun. I don't know how long it will be fun, but, like, I do know that I've st- basically stopped playing Pokemon Go because this is that, but f- with things but to good, do. But a game? Yeah. I mean, I miss my, you know, I miss my my, my Pokeboys sometimes. Yeah, they're probably still there. Yeah, no, they are. It's cool. Anyway, Dave, what is our fourth star of the week? Our fourth star of the week, Matt, is uh, I was out the today and I saw something that filled me with like bafflement and rage. Okay. And it was, it was like, it was an SUV. All like right. Like a smallish SUV. Like as far as SUVs go, it wasn't a huge SUV. But it was, like, definitely an SUV. Okay. All right. But it was, it was, and it was called a Countryman. Okay. And it is produced by Mini Cooper. It is a Mini Cooper SUV. So it's a, it's a Maxi Cooper? So it's a, just rip your mind. Like it's a the Mega Cooper. Point, It's a Mega Cooper. I was just like, I just saw it. Oh, no, Dave, I'm sorry. It's a Monster Cooper. This is the monster truck of Mini Coopers. It was the the most bizarre thing. It's like a Mini... Like, the whole point of the Mini Cooper is that it's Mini. It's it's called Mini, but now it's like a brand. No, Dave, the the point of Mini Cooper is that they're fun and from England. (laughs) You know what, Matt? I'm sorry. I can stop my rant right there because you're right. The point of Mini Cooper is that they're fun and from England, not that they're small. And if you will buy, like, this shouldn't be surprising, right? Because what American no, Americans don't actually want Mini Coopers. If they did, we would just buy smart cars. What we want is something that's fun and from England and also an SUV. And right. so if you can get us a Mini Cooper that is funded from England and is also an SUV, of course we'll buy it. Did it have like the Union Jack uh, rear view mirrors on the su- or side view mirror thing? Oh gosh, you know, it was facing the other way ah. so I didn't see. So yeah, I just <laughs> saw it and I just like, just my brain fizzled a little bit and it made me mad so I wanted to talk about it. Um, what's our fifth star of the week? Dave, speaking of things that I saw and made my brain fizzle and I really just need to get it out there. Dave, I went to, maybe for the first time in 25 years, I went to a Mr. Hero the other day. 
Why? Eh, there's one right by the office. I was working from home that morning. I needed to grab something for lunch on my way in, and I thought, hey, why not? And actually, I was, it was way greasier than I was hoping for, but the flavor of the food was actually pretty good. Okay. I, I will give that to the Mr. Hero, which is a Cleveland fast food chain, uh, if you don't know what that is. Um, I got a Roman burger, which is like a burger that also has like fried... Rome. Like, it has the entire city of Rome yes. recreated on it in cheese. Uh, no, it's uh, it's got like fried uh, like ham and salami on the burger. It's actually not bad. Um, anyway, but that that is not the point, Dave. The point is that they had a sign up inside the restaurant, and it was not many restaurants do. It was not a fancy sign, but the font of the sign was meant to communicate a kind of fanciness. Mm-hmm. If, okay, you know what I mean? Yeah. So are we on like the? Are we on? Like, what kind of fanciness? Is this like a Helvetica fanciness? Well, let me... No, 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 no. Let like me a tell... Like stout? Uh, no, it was sort of like a loopy cursive. Got it. Okay. Um, meant to look sort of like the handwriting of someone elegant. I don't know. Right. Like a, so like a Lucida Sands, maybe? Yeah. And, and so what it said, Dave, the, the words on the sign is it said, Chef-inspired recipes... Mm. And it had a picture. I can already tell this is going to be good now. And it had sort of like a cutaway picture of a guy's, you know, of a chef. And the, the name tag said, Corporate Chef. <laughs> and my here's my question to you, Dave. What is a chef-inspired recipe? And why would you want one? Because, Dave, I don't want a chef-inspired recipe. I want a chef's recipe. So, no, like okay. What, listen, like again. that is that that middle word in there completely redefines what they're getting at, and I'm not exactly sure how you could have a chef inspired recipe that was not also just a chef's recipe, unless someone who is very clearly not a chef watched a chef do something and thought, okay, I think I get it. Let's okay. give this a shot. This is perfect, and I think you've hit the nail on the head, Matt. Chef is, I think, one of those terms that's, like, a little bit loosey-goosey. Like, there's nothing that says you, like, there's, like, official. But, you know, it's just, like, you should have gone to, like, culinary school is is the sort of general idea, right? Right. And so I do like the idea of chef-inspired recipes. I am in love, like, just deeply like, Dave, in love. Imagine if someone tried to say, like, oh, this is a teacher-inspired lesson plan. <laughs> Right. Well, I think so. Here's the thing: if it was again, if it was like a collaboration, like oh, I'm a teacher and I was inspired by another teacher, it's fine, right? But <laughs> someone just like I watched a teacher do a thing once, um, check and out, that makes me an expert. Check out my computer. What, I'm writing some programmer inspired code. <laughs> I am deeply sorry. I am deeply in love with any. I love nonsense phrases like of that of that particular ilk, because like I just love how they don't mean anything. Right. What it means is we got a new sandwich that's slightly fancier than our other sandwiches. The Man, old the old ones. We're not even. We didn't even try. But now we're putting a different mayonnaise on it. <laughs> Right, I love uh, I love chef inspired recipes. I love farm fresh. That's a really big one. I love farm fresh. I love a uh, premium. Love the phrase premium, because like this, these are completely non controlled. They mean, they mean nothing. Like there's no standard for what you what you can and cannot say for any of this stuff. Right, there's not an and American it, board of premium products that's like okay, we we you can have our stamp of approval. It's like no, back it up, Buster. Uh, no, no I love like, it. And then I also, I do also appreciate, because I think it's the, like, things like that, if you look back and you're like, you know those old, uh, uh, like, pre-meme memes, effectively is what they were, and they were like, this is a crazy law from some whacked out town in New Hampshire, and it's like, you can't carry a beaver through a church on a Sunday. Right, you can't you know I mean? shoot a whale from the passenger side of your car. <laughs> right, all this crazy stuff. The use of the word premium is like a modern instance as to like where those laws come from. Because like eventually somebody gets angry enough. It's like, no, you can only call it premium if like X and Y and Z. 
because like they're so tired of reading about it, and like somebody makes a law, and then like three hundred years from now, it's like, do you know you can only you can legally be shot in the town of Salem, <laughs> Massachusetts, if you call cheese premium? Like that's where that stuff comes from. You can only call it premium if it comes from the French region of prime. Otherwise, it's just good cheese. <laughs> Man. Dave, uh, I guess speaking of um, unqualified but definitely true grandiose claims, are you ready to record another episode of this, The Greatest Show on Earth? I certainly am, Matt. Uh, then, okay, we are going to take a break, and when we come back, we are going to discuss episode 22 of Gekiso Sentai Car Ranger, The Tragic Traffic Rule Habit. Uh, it was Its original air date was July 26th. 1996, written by Yoshio Urasawa. You can follow along on the DVDs or on ShoutFactory.tv. Guys, you will want to have seen this one. It's good. Uh, we'll be right back. Okay, welcome back. Episode 22 has got a lot going on in it, Dave. Just, yeah, wow, boy howdy does it. Uh, we start off at Pegasus Motors. Minoru has returned to the office. Uh, he- From... A sales call. Yeah, I'm probably. Um, and I, he is acting as though everyone should be thrilled to see him, but they are all distracted um, because they're all trying to take care of Dapu. Well, the girls, uh, Natsumi and Yuko specifically, are trying to do this. And you may ask, what's wrong with Dapu? I didn't because I don't care. Sure. But you may have. And the answer is, he saw a watermelon and he ate the whole thing including the rind. And the Here's seeds. the insane thing about that. Aside from the fact that he did it at all, the insane thing about that is that he didn't like cut it into slices. He just had a whole watermelon and ate it from like the top down. Right. And apparently he had okay. never seen a watermelon. Like he, he, right. he caught a glimpse of a uncut whole watermelon and thought, oh man, here we go. Yeah. So what that means is that he took a big bite of just rind, or maybe stem and rind, and said to himself, I'm going to see what's under, I'm going to keep going. Right, this, 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 this would is be like promising eating a banana. Enough. Right, this would be like eating a banana, and you just took like a big bite of like the peel, and you were like, I'm, I'm going to keep, I think this is still good. I'm in this for the long haul. So he puts away an entire watermelon, and I ask myself, how is this the car magic guy? Like, how is this the dude that car magic chose? I mean, to, he, like, he's not the fruit magic guy. I mean, yeah, but he, I just. Now, is your problem that he's dumb or that he's dumb yeah. and hideous? <laughs> But no, maybe for whatever alien species he's in, is, Dampu's a real looker. I got no beef with that. And it wouldn't matter if he is or not. But he's a, he's a big dummy. He's a big dumb dummy. And I still kind of hate him. And I don't under... Like, why was this the dude that Car Magic was like, Dapu will be the one to bring Car Ma- Maybe it's just because he's like the only... I think it's because the, the rest of his planet got murdered. Okay, yeah. <laughs> he's the All only right. one left. Um, I mean, I guess I will. The way the Bozo destroyed a bunch of planets before that. Yeah, those planets didn't believe in car magic. Okay, good point. I guess I got to roll this one back a little bit. Sorry, Dapu. I mean, hey, listen, planet's dead. Dapu does still kind of suck, but I, 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 I have his back a little bit on this. Except for okay. the eating the watermelon thing. That's very dumb. Except, I mean, the part of the watermelon that you should eat is great. The rest of it, uh, no thank oh, you. Yeah, I love watermelon. I'll make myself sick on watermelon, dude. Well, it's a, it's I mean, then you and Dapu have something in common, I'm sorry to say. <sighs> Dang, I walked right into that one. <laughs> so Dapu is like lying, like, he's, he's in like a lounge chair recliner with weirdly like a, an ice pack on his head, which doesn't seem to make any sense. Um, but just eating this watermelon has completely ruined his entire day. Well, you never get the, you never get the watermelon sweats. Uh, dude, he is getting the watermelon sweat so much. He is seeing visions, visions of evil watermelons. Like there is a green box somewhere in the room. He sees well, it. Everybody has one. There's cause there's five colored boxes. Oh yeah. Uh, I actually, I thought it was really fun that they used the green one and he just sees, and it, it transforms into an evil watermelon. 
by, I by evil watermelon, was... what what we mean is like a watermelon that's been cut into a jack o' lantern face. A watermelon o' lantern. A jack o' watermelon. A jack o' melon. Jack o' melon. A jack o' melon. I am, I have to say that this that moment really set me up from some disappointment. I genuinely thought we were going to get a watermelon themed monster this week. Oh, did you think that this stupid thing that Dapu did that we've been talking about for five minutes has anything to do with the episode? It doesn't. It's just the I cold did, open. Fact. Yep, it's just new. No, okay, here's what's weird: is it is a cold open kind of because I think of one of the defining characteristics of a cold open are it has nothing to do with the rest of the show. Like, no element of the cold open continues on and is important at all, or in fact, is ever even referenced, which is not the case here. Yeah, uh, I, I, I like agree with you. it's not important, but they do talk about it. Yeah, it, it, it is continued throughout the episode. Like, through this entire episode, Dapu is barely in it because he is, like, on his watermelon deathbed. Okay, so that's the that's the gem with with him. So we go from there to B- Barbarian, and uh, the Roach is still alive. Awesome. Mm-hmm. It's very hot on Barbarian, so I assume this episode aired like in the summer sometime. So it's very hot on Barbarian, and the Roach, like the giant Roach from before who survived, I forget what his Roach. What's his actual name now? You know, he got a name, and we put him on the Creature Royale, but that was when he had, like, his boombox superpowers, and I think he's back to just being Roach now. Okay. So, anyways, so Roach, uh, he's got a fridge open. He's just stuck his head in there. I mean, I get it, man. Cool off. Oh, yeah. Like, before when I was a kid, like, before we had AC, I totally did that. Um, and then Zelmoda, as played by our mom, is like, hey, get your head out of the freezer. It costs a lot of electricity to run it. And I love this because this suggests something that I had never considered about the Bozo. Like, are they worried that it's being wasteful? Like, they're worried that it's wasteful because it's expensive. But, like, who were they paying the utility bills to? It's their planet. Or planetoid. Well, maybe what... Maybe, you know, he's like sort of like looping around like, you know, we've got like a reactor or something that's in the core of this planet running it. But like getting the 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 power source for that is expensive because you've got to go like steal it or buy it or something. But they're doing that know. anyway. They're crime dudes. Well, I don't know that they're necessarily crime dudes as much as like erratic wast- wastrels and like. Like, wastrelry doesn't pay the bills. Like, they're not stealing from all these planets. They're just blowing them up for fun. I mean, they do definitely also steal from them. I remember in the first episode, them just being, like, draped in stolen jewelry. Oh, yeah, they do. Okay, well, man, I don't know. Maybe they're just, like, busy stealing jewelry because it looks rad and not stealing, like, uranium fuel. <laughs> right, like, they're not fencing that jewelry. They're just keeping it because it's neat. Cause, right, because it's baller. Um, So he's, like... So, so you're weak, Zelmoda says to the roach. He's like, what's, you are a roach. I think the idea is like, you're a roach, and so you should be like tough and able to survive anything. And roach just says, roachy roach, 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 because he's a Pokemon, I guess. And he turns around, and this is sort of horrifying, but he like flips up his wing covers, and he's got a sticker on his back that just says cultivated or something, I would assume. And Zelmoda says, wait, you're cultivated? By which I think he means like, like, like farm raised. He's like a farm raised roach or something, right? So like he didn't grow up in like the tough wilds of the the roach wildernesses, and he is therefore a softer, gentler kind of roach. It's yeah. it, it's frankly extremely unclear. Yeah, and the, and the but, only but reason but that we even know this is because like, like context cues from later in the episode. Yeah, Zelmoda, this makes perfect sense to Zelmoda. He's like, oh, you're cultivated, Roach. Of course it makes sense that you're kind of wimpy. Uh, so we go over there, or we, we're in the bar still, and everybody is fanning beauties on that because she's very, very hot. And uh, and then Instructor Richie Hiker walks over, and he's like, you know, I could get us some like a great deal on some air conditioning. 
And President Gunn was like, no, still too expensive. <laughs> right. Like, even if you got us a good deal on the unit, it would be too expensive to run it. So we're just not doing it. Just fans on it harder. Um, <laughs> but now we get into what is actually a problem. Zelmoda comes over and he's like, listen, man, buddy, President Gynamo, my best friend forever, co-founder of the Bozo, we have a problem. Peep, it's hot and we're not making any money, so I guess this is important. And people are quitting. Like, people are leaving the Bozo. Yeah. And then we get, like, a quick montage like a of ser- reasons. Like a series of flashbacks. <laughs> Of people offering, like, why they're leaving. They're like, ah, it's too hot. Oh, I've got to go take care of my family and all of this like, stuff. Like, oh, I hurt my I... arm. Like, ah, I'm just too old to keep doing this. This is amazing. I love this. Because never before has the enemy that's been just trying to destroy the Earth effectively been a social club. Right. They've always been, like, an like, army. And you can't just leave. But the Bozoak are just, like, guys who hang out. So if they get right. sick of hanging out, they just leave. So you've got to, like, President Gaidemo can't just, like, summon new bad guys from the ether. He's like, well, we've got to, like, we've got to convince these people to stay to be part of our, like, rad intergalactic biker club. <laughs> yeah, and so Moda's like, listen, I've got the perfect plan so that we can get a bunch of new recruits all at once. We will cultivate them. And President Gynamo also is inside the show, so he knows what they're talking about. Because of- And what they are yeah. talking about, and we see an image that Zelmoda has in mind. This is a, this is a big got- episode for like flashbacks and dream sequences. So Zelmoda, ha- he's in a room, and he's got like four or six like planters, and there is a child in each one buried up to the neck in dirt, and then there is a national flag for for each child. And for... So there's like a Japanese one, and they've got a Japanese kid. And then they've got like an American one. It's like definitely a white kid. And then they have... Uh, I didn't recognize the flag, but it is clearly supposed to be a flag of an African country. And it's definitely just a Japanese kid in blackface. Oh, is it? Like... Oh, I oh, did yeah. not see that one. Yeah, dog. They did, they did not get an actual... Descendant of Africa to oh, be in this show. Wowzers. Yeah. It was it's the worst thing I've ever seen on on Sentai. It was very bad. No, man, I was I was just so thrown by the fact that there was a white person on screen that like it, it like it sent me into a weird Sentai feedback loop because that happens like once every two seasons. Yeah. Okay. Now let me like listen, man. Like I wouldn't bet the mortgage that that was the case because it was a quick shot, but I'm like barely certain. Uh boy. Oh was... boy. Yeah. Uh, Yikes. <laughs> so that was a real weird and gross moment. So uh, the the the, the idea <laughs> then, I guess, is that he is going to he's going to capture children and then he's going to use a magic watering can. To grow them into monsters, then those monsters will be like Bozo, right? Yes. This is his plan. And everyone's like, oh yeah, of course. Capture the children and use magic watering can. Instructor Richie Hiker. Obviously. I, I think perhaps sensing that like, hey, this is a plan that is not my plan. I'm the plans guy now. Tries to butt in and he's like, hey, um, if you're trying to get all the smart kids... You should take only the Japanese children because they go to cram school all summer. So, like, those are the smartest of all the children, says me, a character in a Japanese television show. Yeah, I did. uh, I dug that. You can just see. You can hear, like, everybody clapping in the background. Yeah, although the, the, the message on that will twist by the end of the episode. And Zelmoda, yeah, a little bit. Zelmoda says, like, hey, this is not your plan. This is my plan. You back off. Like, you know, like, go do whatever it is that you're doing. I'm going to go capture all these Japanese children. So Zanette pipes in and she's like, hey, if you're going to go down and capture a bunch of children, then you should send the Bozoak's number one insect collector. Because that is what she thinks of children. Yeah, so clearly Zanette, like, just sort of does not, does not understand 
does not understand what's going on well, I mean, here. I, I feel like she just like has a general category of pest and has human children and insects in that same category. So if they've yeah. got someone who's good at one, just send them for the other. Anyways, so uh, CC Chaco comes in and he's like a a big bug man, but he's got like sort of a modified beekeeper's hat, mm-hmm. and then also a specimen box that is like affixed to his chest. And he's got a big butterfly net and like huge googly eyes. Um, Dave, I kind of love CC Chaco. Yeah, he's got he's got a good look. Um, he's kind of wild. So we go from there, and we go back. We're, we're down on Earth, and we see Ichitaru, and he like walks out of his house, and his dad's like, "Have a good time at cram school." And Ichitaru sort of like like steps one way, and then tries to like fade his dad real quick, and just like runs the other way. So he's running just away from cram school. And, and his dad sort of tries to chase after him, but like Ichitaro sort of gets ahead of him. Ichitaro gets to uh, the park where Signal Man is standing around complaining about the summer heat. Uh, Signal Man gets a mosquito bite, which is weird because he's a robot from space. Yeah, well, sort of. I'm not sure. I think he might be like a cyborg from space or something. And anyway, Ichitaro rolls up and he says, hey man, you've got to help me. And Signal Man, being a, you know, a responsible space cyborg cuff man, says like, yes, of course, I will help you, citizen. What can I do for you? And Ichitaro says, my dad is trying to get me to go to cram school, but I'm definitely not going to cram school, so you need to help me hide. Yeah. Uh, Signal Man is like, well, I suppose I can help you, like, because he, he doesn't approve of cram school. Because he's like, when I was a kid, and we get another flashback, he's like, when I was a kid, I had to go to, like, traffic cram school, like, all the time. And we get an amazing shot of Kid Signal Man, which is just a kid in, like, a blue morph suit with, like, a shorts and a t-shirt over it, and then a Signal Man helmet. It is very good. But, Dave, I think you maybe misunderstood the scene. Because Signal Man is not saying, I had to go to cram school, so I will help you get away from going to cram school. He said, I had to go to cram school. Going to cram school is important. You definitely have to go to cram school. Oh, okay. I did get, I got a little bit flipped around. And then, because then his, yeah, then his dad shows up and Signal Man is like, hey, I'm going to help you drag this kid to cram school. He needs to do his homework. And then the dad is like, oh man, awesome. Like, thank you so much. So the next thing that we see is them, like, he's taking him to cram school. And, like, Signal Man... I also just love how everybody accepts the authority of Signal Man. I mean, he's got a badge. I mean, that's oftentimes all it takes. So he drops Ichicharu off at cram school. And the president says, dude, that was amazing. I've been having all sorts of trouble. I really owe you one. You've done me a solid. Let me take you off for a beer. Like, let's go get a beer and a snack. My kid's at school. I've got some time. Like, this will be great. Signal Man says, I can't. Like, I'm on duty, man. Like, I'm, I think he's always on duty. I'm not totally sure. But he's like, I'm on duty. I, mean, I can't have a beer. And the president's like, mm, you can have, like, a beer. Yeah, it's fine. This place has got good edamame. Come. And he's just, like, dragging him through town to go to this bar that he likes. Apparently his afternoon bar. So, like, he, he man, like, he drags him all the way there. Uh, we we cut away real quickly and we see CC Chaco, who like just shows up at the school and it's like kids and starts to like try to grab kids. <laughs> um, we cut from there. We outside of the cram school. We see Kyosuke run it, walking around. He's got a map. I don't know what he's doing. It doesn't matter. And he sees the kids running. Yeah, and specifically he sees Ichitaro get nabbed by CC Chaco. Yeah, and he's like, oh uh, man, like. I am a hero. That is a kid I know. Like, this is... Gotta go save him. Yeah, like, this is my time to shine. And he starts right. running across the street to go chase them. But as he does, Signal Man shows up and is like, whew, good thing I managed to avoid drinking that beer. Um, and he sees Kyosuke about to cross the street. But Dave, Kyosuke does not have a walk sign. And so right. Signal Man just grabs him. And he is like, you cannot cross yet. You are under arrest for jaywalking. And Kyosuke's like, dude, there is a Bozoke monster right there stealing a child. A child that you know. We need to go help him. Signal Man's like, 
Oh man. Ah. Uh, yes. I really wish I could I, help. I wish I could help. I'm very I am worried. Also very concerned about young Ichitaru, but like, there's not a. It's a stop sign. Like we have to wait. Like he can't. Like he can't go. Right. He's like ever since I was a child and went to cram school and really studied about what you do with the red light. Like it really just locked its way into my brain. I can't go against that. Like hardwired cram school programming. Right. So we're seeing, we're like flashing back and forth between this internal, this monologue that he's doing and CC Chaku, who is Chaco, who is still just running. Like, I have no idea where he's going or how far he has to get. Because like, it's because they can all teleport like at will, but but he's got each other. He's still running away. Finally. Oh, no, no, no. He finally sort of like loops around. He's like, man, this is really bad. Like, this is a problem. The sign flips, or the walk sign flips finally. They kind of like run, but it's too late. CC Chanko and Ichitaru are gone. And Signal Man now is like, I really boofed it, man. Right. Like, like this is really bad. My, a childhood of cram school has broken my brain, and like, it has caused me to lose a child. Like, this is, how could I do this? And Kyosuke is like, yeah, how could you do this? This is 100% your fault. Yeah, like I'm not. <laughs> like he does not let him off the hook. Uh, but single man, single man does not re- react well to this situation. By which I mean, he starts furiously punching himself in the head, like a lot. Yeah, and will not I stop. Have... Like Kyosuke is trying to stop him from doing it and cannot. Yeah, I feel like I have seen this as a thing in, like, either anime somewhere or, like, other Sentai as, like, a, like oh, I'm such a dummy, like, I'm sort of hitting hitting myself in the head. Right, because the, the, way, um, the way in which he is doing it, he is not, like, you know, Tyler Durden fight club in himself. Uh, he is just, like, with both fists simultaneously punching, like, the sides of his head. Like, in, a, in sort of a, a loop. Yeah, now, he is, as you said, Kyosuke's trying to stop him. He's, like, going super overboard. Uh, And then he sort of runs off, and he stops hitting himself in the head, and he starts just bashing his head into a tree. Yes. And then, Dave, what happens? (laughs) Which he does manage to knock over completely by inflicting head trauma on it. Is it still head trauma if it's not your head that's being traumatized? You're using your head to inflict trauma? Is that head trauma? In in his rage and guilt, he headbutts a tree to death. That is what happens yeah. in this episode. So he does that. Uh, he then runs off and like sticks his head in like a giant ceremonial bell and starts doing hitting that with his head. Kyosuke has given up trying to stop him, sort of. And then Kyosuke is just like, fine, you want to hit your head? And he like rings the bell and it's funny. Yeah, and then finally, Signal Man runs up again, and he sees a wall, and he's like, "Oh, I failed Ichitaru!" And he bashes his head into the wall enough times, and he knocks a big hole in the wall, which would be really bad, except it happens to be the wall behind which the Bozok have been hiding. Right, like the Bozok are not there, but their car is parked there. So yeah. they look now, through. Astonishingly, Matt, I do have to say. They actually surprised me with that one. I was not thinking that this was like I did not think that like the head bashing was going to lead like actually in and be go an somewhere. Point. Yeah, I just figured it was like a thing for laughs. Well, they they they, they'd already given you the old bait and switch with the watermelon gag earlier. You're like, well, clearly that's not part of it, so this can't be either. Yeah, they did. So there's the bozok behind a wall, and Signal Man turns to Kiosk and he's like, "Hey, ordinary citizen, you stay here." Because Kyosuke's like, oh, okay, like, let's go and, and help him. He's like, no, citizen, you stay here. This is too dangerous. I, signal man, will go and, like, rescue Ichitaro. Yeah, so he he runs into this warehouse, and Kyosuke's like, well, cool, I'm calling the car rangers, have fun. <laughs> he says that not to him, obviously, because it's a secret for no reason. So signal man runs in, and he sees this, like, the same sort of setup from the dream sequence earlier. Like... Uh, CC Chaco and Zomoda have captured the children. They're in planters. He has given them the special fertilizer. He has the special watering can, and now he begins to water the children. And their heads like 
kind of start to morph into monster heads. Yeah, it's, uh... And when I, when I say morph, I mean, like, there are progressively more layers of, like, bad monster makeup and masks, like, affixed to their heads with spirit gum. Yes, they do manage to get in, like, a little special effect, like, morphing, like, very early, you know, like, very, very early CGI. But Signal Man rolls in. Like, he rolls in on his bike into the rescue, and then Zelmoda's like, hold up, this is fine, like, we know his weakness now. CC Chaco, get on it. CC Chaco, like, throws his, like, butterfly net but instead of a net now, there's a sign. Like, there's a stop sign. And it lands in front of him, and Signal Man sees it and just stops. Like, he cannot control himself. Right. Like, when he sees a traffic sign, he must obey it. And so Zelmoda and CC Chaco in a series of whumpers, like, have this whole course set up where they're like, okay... Like, the sign is here, so he won't be able to come towards us. There's another sign over there that says, he ha- like, like, you know, right lane must turn right. So he's going to take a right, and that's going to get him out of the warehouse. Then, he, like, there's going to be boxes in front of him, but he won't be able to turn around because there's a no U-turn sign. And he's going to shoot through this, like, wall of boxes. And then there's a crosswalk... And there's a pedestrian on the crosswalk, but the pedestrian is a whumper. But it doesn't matter because there is a pedestrian on the crosswalk, so he won't be able to proceed, and he just has to stop. And that's when we hit him with the dynamite. It's it's amazing. Oh my gosh. It's so like it is a pretty wild plan. And uh, what's even better about it is that it it definitely works. Right, like it's one of those things that so, like makes perfect logical sense within the world of this show. Like you have this unstoppable super cop. His one great like love and passion is following every single traffic law. So eventually you just need to figure out how to turn that against him. Right. And he actually says like as he's about to be dynamited, he's like my body obeys these rules without consent. Like I should not have gone to cram school as much. Like I should have goofed around more in the summer. My inability to be flexible about traffic laws has, has screwed me here. Now, Dave, I, so I don't know next... I don't know how you feel about that sentiment as a as a school teacher, but as the king of summer, I definitely agree. I uh, you know, I am Let's not get into it. It's not funny. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to start going off on my, like, my thing about how I don't actually like summer vacation. We really should switch like a year round more intermittent vacation schedule, but that's not comedy. That's just good pedagogical practice. Anyways. Anyway, so the dynamite hits the space cop. <laughs> dynamite hits the space cop. That's funny. So uh, commercial break, we go back and his, his body is like netted slash chained to... It's just like a big harness thing, but it's painted to look like traffic stuff. It's like black and yellow stripes. And CC Chaco is there, and Zomoda is there, and Zomoda's like, all right, CC Chaco, finish it. Like, make him a specimen. And CC Chaco pulls out like a four foot pin that he is going to use to stab Signal Man. Yes. Did I tell you, I like CC Chaco. I like CC Chaco. I love this. I like that his finishing move is a giant pin and he just turns you into a specimen. It's devastating, also slightly creepy. It's very cool. So he so, he is about uh, to do this, uh, and at this moment, that is when the car rangers arrive. So yeah, so the car rangers arrive and they're like, Oh man, we will there's like an explosion, they're like, We'll save you. Blah 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 blah. So uh the guys start fighting uh, Natsumi and Yuko like run over and uh, get Signal Man free and then as they're about to start fighting CC Chaco shoots giant exploding eyeballs out of his eyes at them dude this I, I love this because it's not just eye lasers it's lasers that are also eyeballs which is this is actually not the first time I've seen this effect I know there's an early episode of Zhu Ranger that has a monster, like a skeleton monster that has a similar thing. And I feel like we've seen it in another episode as well. I don't know what makes them like pull the trigger on doing eyeball, like exploding eyeball lasers instead of just like 
eye lasers. Yeah, but every time they do it, I love it. Yeah, because it's just so... It's such a weird thing. Like, it's just such a weird choice. Like, yeah, man, this dude just launches his eyeballs out, but then they're immediately replaced by more eyeballs, but the eyeballs do explode. So he shoots the eyeball lasers, but then they all shoot him with their gun guns, and he falls over. Uh, Zomoda gives him the Imoyochan. He grows. We cut to Dapu trying to, like, send RV Robo to go, like, you know, so they can fight him. But he is still kind of on, you know, on the mend. So he's just, like, struggling to shout out, like, Yes, RV Robos, go to Rangers. This is a bad day for Dapu. (laughs) But they do. They get there. He sets up uh, RV Robo. um, But then he gets... RV Robo gets caught in a giant electrified bug net. Yes, uh, I really dig it. I just, I really love it. Anytime the giant robot fight is more than just is more than like three seconds long. It's not a whole lot longer, but they do get in. Like he's it's, it's like a giant net. It's it's pretty rad. Uh, and then Cyrender Cyrender shows up, and uh, he has a giant riot shield, which we haven't seen before. Really liked that. Thought that was very cool. Uh, but then that's that's like basically yeah. We, we, he, we, he pulls out like Vulcan cannon, yeah. and then it was weird. Is that Vulcan cannon is the thing that kills him? He doesn't like RV Robo does not then have to get in there with Kakiso Cut. Are you right? I think that's the first time that we have. Um, no, I think the first episode Cyrender showed up in, he finished the enemy. I do want to say, though, real quick before we close off our uh, CC Chaco fight, that when he was giant, he also had giant eye lasers, and that was very good. Oh, yeah. I forgot to put that in my notes. I'm glad you remembered it. So um, so that's it. So CC Chaco goes down, and Zelmoda's like, all right, I guess this this one this one is over. Um, but we still, this is not the end of the episode because we, we still have these kids that are like halfway transformed. So we're all in human form, like, or, uh, you know, human size again. And we run back into the thing and signal man, the Rangers are like, we've got to run over and help these kids. And signal man just says, no, stop. Like I'll solve this problem. And he pulls out the signalizer and turns it into gun mode. Right. And me, and I think it's me and but it could have been any of them. We're like, Hey, um, those are children. You're a safety officer. Like, Aren't there like rules and protocols that you're supposed to follow that tell you to not shoot lasers at children? And he's like, and Sig- he's like, no, now is not the time for rules. I've learned my lesson. Now is the time for courage and action. And he shoots his laser gun at the children, and then they're saved. So I guess the the lesson of this episode is that now Signal Man is no longer like a rules lawyer person who is like bound by his past now he is a reckless renegade ready to shoot children at the first sign of trouble listen man if the 80s have taught me anything uh 80s movies i should say rather about cops is that like that's the cop you need oh yeah i mean an 80s movie renegade cop is the yeah, the that's, val- that's prime it's police just as officer. good as an entire police force yeah, that's that's really all you need. Uh, ideally, somebody will call Signal Man in and demand his gun and badge. At some point in this, I guess it would be Dapu. I don't know. I don't know. No, Dapu's not like his. Dapu's not Signal Man's boss. We don't know well, if there is a chief of space traffic police. Oh yeah, good point. I assume I there don't know. must this be. Is, I guess. Unless Signal Man is more of like a ranger sort of, uh, ranger sort of like a space ranger, like a, like a Texas ranger, right? But for traffic sort of like in out. space, but for traffic in space, yeah. So we go from there, and then we get our sort of final scene, which is every like Ichitaru is out with his father's employees and Signal Man. His parents are not there, and uh, they're eating shaved ice and like doing sparklers. And, yeah, they're uh, they're having, a, they're, having a, they're having a nice summer now that they're free of the tyranny of cram school, right? And there's like a couple of lines about how like a signal man is like you do need to do your homework, and everyone's like, dude, so give it a rest, signal man. Like signal man has loosened up, but he's like he still thinks you should do your homework. And they're all doing uh, and they're all eating a uh, Japanese style shaved ice, 
which is which looks delicious. It does look delicious. I would love some right now. Yeah. Do you know this about like Japanese are super intense about their shaved ice? It's like a thing. It's called kakigori. Mm-hmm. It's just it's just like they have like whole. It's like a snow cone, but like amazing. I, and they put con- sweetened condensed milk on it and then syrup. It looks incredible. Anyways. Oh, it sounds pretty good. I know. Uh, I think that there is a particular sort of shaved ice in Hawaii as well. Uh, yes, I believe there is. Welcome to our new podcast within a podcast. The shaved ice time. The, the shaved ice age. Oh, yeah, that's we're much having better. a shave. Nice time. I don't know, man. Uh, anyway, that's the. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the first and probably only episode of the Shaved Ice Age, uh, Dave. That is not only the episode of the Shaved Ice Age, or the end of the episode of the Shaved Ice Age. It is also the end of the episode of Gekiso Sentai Car Ranger. But it is not the end of the episode of License to Car Ranger yet, because first we need to figure out where CC Chaka uh, lands in the Creature Royale. Okay, so I dig CC Chaka. Again, he doesn't get... I feel like this is the case with like basically all the monsters in this season. He does not get nearly enough play. Um, you know, I, I feel like there's a lot more they could have done with him. But I do think he's going to be up near, at least closer to the top of the list. Okay, the, the place that I want to start looking is at Kama Atachi the Sickle Weasel. Because Kama Atachi okay. the Sickle Weasel also had a very cool look. He also kidnapped children and transformed them into monsters. Ooh, good point. Now, CC Chunka does not turn them into monsters. So, well, I, I mean, I don't... like the, the the end result of that plan was that those children were going to be turned into monsters. Oh yeah, that's right. Okay, I guess I wasn't. No, no, no. You're totally right. I mean, of course he was. I just wasn't thinking of it in the same same way as Kami Itachi. So he's got that weird, cool hat. He's got the long like pin that he throws like a spear. That I think is the thing that puts he's got, it over. He's for got me. like two different kinds of bug nets, uh, and he's got giant exploding eyeballs. Like that, that stuff's all great. He doesn't have a jetpack. Um, and the other great thing about the sickle weasel, well, the the, the sickle weasel episode was creepier than this one, right? Like there was genuine yeah. like horror stuff in that episode. Um. But, like, just as a monster, I think Sisi Chaco is maybe more fun, at least, than Kama Itachi. I, I don't know how much further he goes above that, though, because, like, two slots up, we have, what was his name, Kasha, the fireworks monster. And he kidnapped children to turn them into fireworks. Yeah, well, I think that's actually probably very, very good. So he's better than the other monster that turns them into monsters, but he's not quite as good as the guy who kidnaps children to turn them into fireworks. So that just leaves us there's one person in between those two who is Omi Bozu, the the navy monster. Yeah, Omi Bozu is like a weird uh he's like he's from uh Kaku Ranger. Yeah. And he's like a vengeful spirit of a priest who drowned at sea is the actual monster. Oh, but... this was the dude who um like put the giant skull on the side of the building so that um uh young noble junior could play his rock concert from hell to like turn everything to skulls and bring back his evil father, right? Like, yes. like, Omi Bozu was, like, a big, like, an instrumental part of that whole thing. Yeah, I think that's a great spot for him. So, that makes CC Chaco the new number 55. A nice show. Which I think is top third, at least. Yeah. Is that right? They're about uh, at holy least, cat. yeah. Not, not quite, but close. It's a lot of monsters, Dave. <laughs> That's just there are just so many monsters. Uh, but but now, Dave, that finally is going to do it for another episode of License to Car Ranger. Uh, before we finish up here, I'd like to remind you all that you can email the show at supersentibrothers at gmail dot com uh, if you want to get any updates on future episodes or check out the things we're talking about on Twitter or talk to us there. We are at Super Sentai Bros. If you like the show, please remember that shining in the iTunes review section there are five stars. 
Please rate, review, subscribe on Apple Podcasts or the podcatcher of your choice. Um, that would be super cool of you. The Super Sentai Brothers are a production of Retrograde Orbit Radio. To listen to any of the other great Retrograde Orbit Radio shows, you can do that all at RetrogradeOrbitRadio.com. Once again, we're the Super Sentai Brothers. I'm Matt. I'm Dave. And we'll see you next week for the greatest show on Earth.